Pate is the Honorable Minister responsible for education. Thank you, Madam Speaker. When we left off, I was talking about some of the services that the, um, the employment services arm of the NWDA provides, and I just wanted to mention briefly in conclusion to that particular um, unit, they also work with registrants who have criminal records who are actively being assisted to find employment opportunities. Again, Madam Speaker, this is the government's effort and attempt to try to address the incidence of high recidivism in this regard um, by helping these persons find meaningful employment. Madam Speaker, moving to the scholarship services unit of the NWDA, there are currently over 1,200 students, Madam Speaker, on government scholarships. Approximately 800 of those are local scholars and approximately 450 overseas scholars. Madam Speaker, I just want to quickly acknowledge the very hard work of a very small team which is comprised of the scholarship secretariat led by the manager of the unit, Ms. Deirdre Carmola, and um, her three additional, which includes one secondi who works in that. They work tirelessly to support these 1,200 plus students receiving government assistance to pursue post-secondary studies. And Madam Speaker, as a result of re-engineering the process upon taking office um, in 2013, we quickly looked at how can we find efficiencies and how can we make the system work better. One of the things that we did was we introduced an earlier registration process and deadlines for application. This, Madam Speaker, I have, I have to say, has led to greater efficiencies in the process thus far and has led to expected earlier notification and approvals for successful applicants for this year's application pool. So that will hopefully put a, a number of parents and students alike minds at ease that hopefully the number of last minute notifications will um, be lessened as a result of these attempts to improve the efficiencies in that regard. Madam Speaker, there was also a very exciting initiative that was launched this year in partnership with the Cayman Islands Yellow Pages. The Scholarship Secretariat created a Cayman Scholarship Directory, which was published in March of this year, and it includes all public and private sector scholarships available in the Cayman Islands, so as to facilitate the opportunities available to our young people so they'll know which scholarship, um, available which scholarship opportunities exist both in the public and private sector in one convenient location. And Madam Speaker, the, the Secretariat has distributed over 3,000 copies to local schools, including public and private schools. And uh, we want to acknowledge the generous sponsorship by local companies in actually publish, pu publishing these directories. Madam Speaker, the Secretariat has worked with the Computer Services Department to build the scholarship online program interface which, Madam Speaker, will, rep will replace and enhance customer service, automation, and the application process for scholarships going forward. And it is expected that this new interface will be rolled out uh, in time for the new crop of scholarship applicants starting in November of this year. Madam Speaker, the Secretariat also worked to introduce an NWDA student registration portal whereby all students on government scholarship will now be required to register with the NWDA in attempt to better facilitate internships and tracking of career progression in general of these students who are benefiting from government assistance. This is one of the issues uh, or areas of concern, Madam Speaker, um, as a country, what are we doing to address the, the needs or to assist our returning graduates in obtaining employment? And so by making it a requirement of students who receive government assistance to actually proactively get into the system and be able to access the opportunities that are available to them as a result of being registered with the NWDA. It will hopefully facilitate better and seamless job seeking and internship uh, acquiring um, opportunities once they have completed their period of studies. Madam Speaker, this year, the Scholarship Criteria Review Subcommittee of the Education Council also completed the task of reviewing and making recommendations regarding revising the scholarship criteria to be adopted and utilized by the Education Council. And currently, those recommendations are being presented to the wider council for consideration 
and uh, determinations are being made with respect to acceptance and adoption of those recommendations. And the intention would be for those recommendations that are adopted to utilize a phased implementation approach to that. Madam Speaker, we also heard about the hospitality training school from the Ministry and the Minister of Tourism um, and the collaboration that is existing currently between the Ministry of Tourism and the Ministry of Education. Uh, and I also want to acknowledge the hard work of all players involved in getting that off the ground and making that a success. And I also want to say um, that I look forward to the hospitality industry absorbing each and every one of the graduates of that program at the end of the program this year. Madam Speaker, speaking about employment initiatives for the 2015-2016 year, as I said, the, the Ministry of Employment will look to create a national training council which will act as an advisory um, or advise, advisors and will help to participate and support the development, coordination and management of technical and vocational education and training in the Cayman Islands. The council will consist of representatives from key TVET industries and will be supported by the ministry and the NWD and in particular the TVET posts that I spoke to earlier in my contributions. Again, the council, one of the remit or the, the mandates of the council is to develop and a mechanism in order to register private sector businesses who deliver training and development programs to ensure that minimum standards are met. Madam Speaker, the country, the government is committed to funding um, persons looking to pursue technical and vocational education and training, but we are also mindful of the need to ensure that there are minimum standards being offered by these programs that will be accepted by the industries themselves. And so that is why we're taking the approach to get the industries involved in developing what these minimum standards are because the ultimate goal of these training programs is and should be gainful employment at the end or during the process. And so we notice that there are a number of programs that are disconnected with what the industries are calling for. So by bringing industry to the table, this is how the government will successfully move towards implementing a TVET strategy that deals with the needs of our people, which is to lead to employment opportunities or entrepreneurial opportunities, if that is what it comes down to. Madam Speaker, the expansion of the TVET and apprenticeship opportunities will continue through public-private partnerships. And as I said, on the heels of the very successful launch of the Education and Work Experience Initiative with Cayman Finance, which targeted the financial services industry, the Ministry of Employment is already in talks with other key industry representatives in the construction and building management industries with the aim of launching additional apprenticeship programs in the coming 2015-2016 fiscal year. So watch this space, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the employment services arm, as I said, is working in conjunction with the Immigration Department to create a national clearinghouse of employment opportunities, whereby providing central location for all private sector jobs in the Cayman Islands to be lift, listed. However, Madam Speaker, as I indicated before, the success of this program is dependent now on the staff of the two ministries, Ministry of Home Affairs and the Ministry of Employment, working together to achieve the collective goal of the government. Madam Speaker, as this is now an e-government priority, the project should benefit from the coordination and the support of the Director of e-government and the Cabinet Office in this regard. And um, Councillor Sukou, as Councillor for e-government, I am um, beseeching that he continues to stay vigilant to ensure that the policy goals and directives of the government, as set out, are in fact being carried out in this regard. Madam Speaker, the launch of the new scholarships online program in November 2015 will, as I said, take um, a phased approach with respect to the recommendations of the Education Council, but also the actual platform will be in place, which will greatly enhance or even further enhance the automation and efficiency of the process. The Yellow Pages is also working with the Scholarship Secretary to create a student recognition directory, Madam Speaker, whereby returning graduates will be featured 
highlighting their degrees obtained and other information of interest to employers. Again, this is a concrete, tangible initiative which is geared at, at dealing with the needs of helping our returning graduates access employment by actually creating a tool which features their accomplishments as such. Madam Speaker, at this stage, it's important for me to address that contrary to certain claims made um, in this house and in other forums, funding for scholarships has not been cut. I repeat, funding for scholarships has not been cut. What has been cut, Madam Speaker, is the political favoritism and the inequality as it relates to the grant of scholarships. Madam Speaker, it is unfair for some students to receive up to three times as much under the previous Nation Building Scholarship Program, up to, in some cases, $75,000 per year, as compared to other students who are, in recipient of the, who are recipients of the established Education Council scholarships, who can only receive, at, this, at present, up to twenty dollars or $25,000 per year, depending on their category of study. While, Madam Speaker, the Young Nation Building Scholarship Program recipients have different and in some cases lower GPA requirements than those students who are on the Education Council Scholarship Program. Madam Speaker, the scholarship program of any government should not be about creating loopholes or a culture of entitlement. But instead, Madam Speaker, it should be engendering and inspiring a culture of achievement a culture of accomplishment, and a culture of pursuing excellence. Madam Speaker, this has been recognized, and some of the new criteria adopted by the Education Council will, in fact, be introduced, whereby students that demonstrate competence, students that demonstrate achievement in both tertiary as well as technical and vocational education and training, or TVET pursuits, they will be given the opportunity to receive greater sums of scholarship funds if it is an, in alignment with the priority occupations as well. So, Madam Speaker, we must create a system that inspires our people to want to achieve more, to want to push themselves beyond their comfort zones, because, Madam Speaker, growth and innovation requires such. We cannot advance as a country, Madam Speaker, if our people are not incentivized to do so, if our people are not given opportunities to do so, and that is exactly the kind of environment, the pursuit of lifelong learning, growth, personal development, and excellence, which this coalition government is seeking to create by the kinds of policies which we are developing and adopting. Madam Speaker, fairness, equity, and reward for hard work is key. Madam Speaker, speaking very briefly to the national training program of the Passport to Success, as I indicated, the government is continue, is, is, uh, will continue and is committed to continuing to fund that program. But what we have done, Madam Speaker, is in a proactive move to respond to the concerns of the, of the young people that the program targets in many instances, we have increased the age of eligibility from 21 as a standard to 22. And we have also made it possible for persons who between the ages of 23 to 25 can be considered for the program on a case-by-case -case basis if they are recommended to do so by the NWDA. Because, Madam Speaker, we know, given the, the statistics, that there are great concerns amongst our young people and employment, and so as a result of the popularity of the program, but also as a result of the need to address as many persons in this particular space as possible, we were very proactive and creative in trying to find solutions that we could action immediately to address these needs. And this is one way that we did that, which was to actually change the eligibility criteria in this regard. But Madam Speaker, it's important, as I said before, and I'll say again, that although it is an important part of the NWDA, the work that the NWDA does, work undertaken by the NWDA is more than just about finding people jobs. Although, Madam Speaker, that is, as I said, happening as well. Because if we look at the statistics, overall, unemployment is down from 6.3% in 2013 to 4.7% in 2014. 
And looking specifically at Caymanians, Madam Speaker, unemployment has dropped as well from a high of 10.5% in 2012 to that of 9.4% in 2013 and a further drop to 7.9% in 2014. So, Madam Speaker, under this government, Caymanians are in fact getting jobs and finding work. But, Madam Speaker, jobs are here and gone tomorrow. There is no more evidence of this than what is happening in today's world, where many jobs in the Cayman Islands are provided by global multinational companies whose business decisions for expansion leading to increased job opportunities or contraction leading to redundancies and layoffs are made far beyond these shores. We operate in a global economy, Madam Speaker, and so the impacts of that global economy, for better or worse, will impact our local experiences. So, Madam Speaker, we must prepare our people for the prospect of multiple careers in their lifetime. We must prepare our people to be adaptable to the changing technology-driven economy and by helping them to develop and enhance their skill sets to capitalize on the new opportunities and to be able to grow and adapt to the changing employment conditions. But, Madam Speaker, we must also ensure that those who are willing, able, and capable of taking advantage of the job opportunities that do exist, that they are given the ability to do so. Madam Speaker, the primary employment mechanism of this country, the immigration law which outlines who can be gainfully employed in this country, and the work permit regime administered by the Immigration Department and its boards must work, and the law must be applied and enforced by the Immigration Department and its boards to benefit the people of the Cayman Islands, but also the economy of the Cayman Islands as a whole. Madam Speaker, it is encouraging to hear of the greater collaboration taking place between the various departments working to address the issues of unemployment amongst locals. We heard this in a number of the uh, presentations by my fellow colleagues and the government bench. Departments such as the Department of Family and uh, Children and Family Services, Department of Counseling Services, Department of Commerce and Investment, the NWDA, and the Immigration Department, to name a few. It is absolutely essential, Madam Speaker, that this collaboration continues in order for the country to make even greater strides in helping to ensure that those who can work, do work. Madam Speaker, moving on to an issue that the Premier made the announcement in his policy statement, and that is the issue of minimum wage. Madam Speaker, I want to begin my discussion on this topic by stating a quote by Ralph Waldo Emerson, which states, do not go where the path may lead. Go instead where there is no path and leave a trail. Madam Speaker, that is exactly what has been done by this government. A year ago, in my 2014-2015 budget debate, I informed this honorable house about the plan being embarked on to determine an appropriate national minimum wage regime for the Cayman Islands. A plan, Madam Speaker, that started in earnest in January of 2014, just seven months after taking office as Minister Responsible, when I visited the United Kingdom Low Pay Commission during an official trip to London to deal with both education and employment-related matters. And Madam Speaker, whereas the, the member from East End and the member from Northside would like to take the credit as spurring the government on to address this issue, the work on developing an appropriate national minimum wage regime actually began before the private member's motion was brought by the members from the East. However, what the private member motion did do, Madam Speaker, was allow me to outline in great detail what the government's plan of action was to address the issue and to determine an appropriate minimum wage to adopt. A plan, Madam Speaker, that has been executed and followed just as I had outlined it to be on a number of occasions in this Honorable House since February 2014. Madam Speaker, this coalition government promised and we have delivered. And on a personal note, Madam Speaker, the country should take comfort in the fact that as Minister and as a representative of the people of West Bay, I do not make promises that I cannot keep, and I keep my promises. 
That is the kind of trust you want to have in your elected representatives, Madam Speaker. And that is the kind of trust you want to have in your government. And I go as far as saying that is the kind of trust that you should have in this coalition government. Madam Speaker, the government took office with a plan. Independents and PPM party members alike. We quickly got down to business to flesh out the details of the plan, which was shaped by both the independent members' national priorities plan and the PPM manifesto, and moved swiftly towards execution. That is why, Madam Speaker, we can each stand here as members of this government and outline the many accomplishments of this government, of which we all played a vital role to achieve. And, Madam Speaker, in carrying out the plan, the law was followed with respect to Section 21 of the Labor Law, and a Minimum Wage Advisory Committee was convened in June 2014. And, as they say, Madam Speaker, the rest is history. Madam Speaker, even though I tabled the Minimum Wage Advisory Committee report in April of this year, and painstakingly went through and gave a thorough overview of the key aspects of the report, it is important, Madam Speaker, to remind the public that the $6 per hour minimum wage to be adopted as the minimum wage is not a living wage. It is a minimum wage which no one in this country will be allowed to be paid. The two concepts, Madam Speaker, are different and distinct. Adopting a minimum wage, Madam Speaker, means that we as a country will make it illegal for anyone to get paid below the statutorily manda mandated minimum threshold of $6 per hour, which we now know is above the poverty vulnerability threshold. It certainly isn't a ceiling, Madam Speaker, of what em employers should pay and what employees should negotiate to work for. It is not a ceiling, but it is a floor, one which, based on the economic analysis conducted by the Minimum Wage Advisory Committee, should have a significant impact on lifting those lowest paid workers in our society out of dire poverty while having a minimal effect on inflation and the cost of living and a minimal effect as it relates to job losses for Caymanians. Madam Speaker, introducing a minimum wage at any higher rate than $6 an hour would have a significant negative effect on both the cost of living due to the increased prices for goods and services and job losses due to higher numbers of job losses is expected as a result. So, Madam Speaker, just as this government and myself as Minister was prepared to take the political licks for not accepting the private member's motion in February calling for a $5 per hour minimum wage, choosing instead to take a measured, evidence-based approach to determining the appropriate rate, the government is continuing to take a measured, rational approach to the figure to be adopted and Madam Speaker, quite frankly, the government may still take licks in some quarters by some people who feel that the minimum wage should be higher than $6 per hour. But, Madam Speaker, when listening to those same persons, it is clear that they do not fully understand the ramifications of mandating a higher minimum wage, which would actually increase the cost to businesses, it would increase potential job losses, and it will erode their overall purchasing power due to an increase in prices. Thereby, Madam Speaker, defeating the entire purpose of introducing a minimum wage in the first place. So, Madam Speaker, setting a minimum wage requires a reasoned and pragmatic balance, just like choosing your elected representatives. The accomplishments of this coalition government, Madam Speaker, thus far, with only two years in office, is a testament that the people made the right choice in taking a balanced approach to voting for independent members and party members of the government alike. Madam Speaker, this day has been 30 years in the making. Previous governments, previous ministers of labor, previous politicians, current politicians, aspiring politicians have only talked about it, have only made campaign promises about it time and time again. But for the past 15 years at least, those same said politicians and government administrations failed to take meaningful actions beyond the campaign promises and passing motions in this honorable house to bring about a national minimum wage. And even though those provisions were well enshrined in the law and existed for over half a century, 
Madam Speaker, it was clear, and it is clear, as the current Minister of Employment, there was no political will on the part of those previous government administrations to see beyond the campaign promises after Election Day. However, Madam Speaker, it is my privilege to be the first minister responsible for initiating and seeing the minimum wage process through on behalf of this government. The result has been very thorough and detailed report of the Minimum Wage Advisory Committee. And again, I want to thank the work of the committee. Very capable, dedicated core ministry team as well, who acted as a secretariat to the committee, who supported the work of the committee throughout the process, including drafting the final report. Madam Speaker, the government has accepted those recommendations of the committee and has decided to implement the minimum wage regime based on recommendations to commence in the 1st of March 2016. The report has highlighted areas of legislative changes, many of those to the labor law. And I'm happy to report, Madam Speaker, that many of those changes are already in train and a number of them will be in train in time for the labor bill to be brought to the House and we ask this Honourable House to adopt a new Labour law as well. But, Madam Speaker, the successful implementation of a minimum wage regime will require work to be done by multiple ministries and multiple departments, as outlined in the report. And I look forward to the continued cooperation of the government and the respective ministers and ministries to see the process through in a timely fashion. Madam Speaker, to address the member from East End's concern regarding the level of pushback he anticipates will come from the lobbyists, as he termed them, in his budget debate. Madam Speaker, we recognize that this is a real possibility. However, it is heartening to note, Madam Speaker, that the Chamber of Commerce, in an interview or in a, 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 a participation on CITN, as the largest representative body of businesses in the country, they have already given their support, their public support for the introduction of a $6 per hour national minimum wage. And Madam Speaker, this is a recognition of the fact, I believe, by businesses themselves, that it is no longer acceptable for businesses to compete primarily on the importation of cheap labor. It is no longer acceptable, Madam Speaker, to pay people substandard wages, forcing them to live in substandard conditions. So, Madam Speaker, I thank the member from East End for his words of caution, but I am hopeful that, as with the minimum wage, when the Labour bill is put out for public consultation, we will also have a reasoned and rational response to the fact that, like the absence of a national minimum wage, the country's Labour legislation is inadequate in many instances to address the pressing concerns of a modern economy and the Labour force issues that exist today and that there is a need to revise the almost 30-year-old piece of legislation which has only been tinkered with in the subsequent revisions since it was enacted in 1987. And I look forward to the support of the government and this entire House in our collective fortitude to see the process and the passage of the enactment of the law as well. Minister, you have 30 minutes remaining. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, since taking office and from the very first budget we were responsible for, the government has made a concerted effort to increase the resources of the Department of Labor and Pensions. Madam Speaker, since 2013, there have been six new posts that have been budgeted for and filled since the 2014 or 2013 2014 budget. In addition, Madam Speaker, there are three additional posts which are in the final stages of recruitment as we speak which would increase the staff complement by nine. Madam Speaker, the increase in the staff complement of the Department of Labor and Pensions was desperately needed as both the Labor and Pensions divisions were grossly understaffed for the work required of that department and had been neglected, Madam Speaker, by previous administrations. However, as the remit of the department continues to expand to include additional responsibilities, such as the need to monitor and enforce the law as it relates to the implementation of minimum wage and facilitating a culture of compliance the uh, with respect to pensions obligations, which is now enshrined in the Trade and Business Licensing Law, resources will be needed for the Department of Labor and Pension and provisions will be need to be made accordingly, Madam Speaker. 
Madam Speaker, as a government, we hear the cries as it relates to labor and pensions enforcement. And as a government, we have responded. We have tried to find ways to leverage the synergies between departments where possible, like, for example, Madam Speaker, enshrining the pensions and health insurance compliance requirements as a part of the new trade and business licensing process, putting a positive obligation on the businesses themselves, Madam Speaker, to demonstrate compliance in order to get a trade and business license. We have also increased the resources to boost the regulatory and enforcement arms of the department, as I just outlined. And, Madam Speaker, the third and important arm of that is that we are strengthening the legislative framework for both labor and pensions, and the draft bills for discussions will be forthcoming in the summer of this year. Madam Speaker, the Department of Labor and Pensions during this year has conducted a number of training programs as it relates to the pensions law, labor law, and occupational safety and health. And actually, just recently, Madam Speaker, I participated in the award ceremony for training sessions that were offered to 12 new um, Cayman Islands Fire Service recruits whereby all 12 successfully completed the two-day training session. And this was the first of its kind, Madam Speaker, whereby the Department of Labor and Pensions worked with the fire service in order to ensure that their new recruits are sufficiently trained in occupational safety and health concerns. The, the Occupational Safety and Health um, Department also conducted a number of inspections and investigations and um, expanded their regulatory capacity as it relates to uh, the construction industry in particular. The department also launched new uh, frequently advised or, or FAQs pamphlets which creates greater awareness and consistency in public awareness as it relates to labor and pension laws. So Madam Speaker, For 2015-16, there are a number of exciting initiatives which the Department of Labor and Pensions are undertaking, but one to note at this time includes the fact that they are working with the Truman Bodden Law School, and students from the Truman Bodden Law School will be engaging in an exercise over the summer to recategorize the rulings of the Labor Tribunal and Labor Appeals Tribunals to enhance efficiencies in determining precedents based on past rulings of the tribunals. Madam Speaker, moving to the area of gender affairs. Madam Speaker, one of the areas of concern for this government, uh, and, and, and myself as Minister wearing both Minister of Education and Minister of Gender Affairs hat, was to consider gender-specific issues as it, face, as it faces our children in our schools. And so during the National Education Conference that I spoke about that happened in February of this year, Educators were provided with workshops for the first time to build their capacity and understanding and using basic concepts and tools as it relates to gender and gender analysis and the issues facing our young men and young women in the schools. Madam Speaker, we've also seen that gender-specific issues as highlighted in the PAHO and WHO report on Adolescent Health and Sexuality Survey and Madam Speaker, the Ministry believes that if the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women is extended to the Cayman Islands, one requirement of the Convention is that both sexes have access to information on health services, which will help to mitigate some of the concerns highlighted in the report. And so, Madam Speaker, the Government will continue to work with the Gender Equality Office in the UK to try to move this process along. Madam Speaker, one of the initiatives that the Ministry will embark on in 2015-2016 is an attempt to document the women's universal suffrage movement in the Cayman Islands. Madam Speaker, the Ministry will look to capture the milestones of the women's movement in the country. Because, Madam Speaker, we have history. Now it's time to tell her story. Hearing from people like Mrs. Georgette Ebanks, one of the original surviving group of women, Georgetown petitioners, and 
others calling for the right to vote in the 1940s and 1950s, Madam Speaker. We need a way to preserve our voice in history or her story to come. Madam Speaker, with respect to policy review and legislative reform, I would like to, to formally advise the members of this House that as Minister of Gender Affairs and with the remit of looking at making sure gender issues stay on the forefront of this government administration, I have officially asked cabinet members to ensure that any and all laws falling within each member's purview be amended to reflect gender neutral or gender inclusive language. Madam Speaker, as amendments to legislation are being made or new legislation is being proposed. Again, Madam Speaker, over the years, legislative drafters have adopted a convention and have taken what I term to be a lazy man's approach, pardon the pun, and drafted he to include she in the interpretation. But Madam Speaker, words are powerful. One philosopher puts it, the limits of my language means the limits of my world. Another puts it as saying, if thoughts corrupts language, language can also corrupt thought. So Madam Speaker, I want to publicly thank the Premier for his support in this regard. And I look forward to the cooperation of all cabinet members when making relevant legislative revisions and proposals. Madam Speaker, in the interest of time, I'd like to speak briefly to some of the district-specific issues. And I crave your indulgence um, to be able to address some of the other ministry issues in a different forum. But Madam Speaker, in 2014 and 2015, I have maintained a practice that I adopted from the very beginning in trying to address the needs of my constituents in West Bay by having and hosting weekly constituency clinics on Wednesday afternoons. Madam Speaker, obviously when I'm in the House or when I'm traveling on official or other business, then I can't hold those clinics. But Madam Speaker, I can attest to you and the members of this house that but for those times, you can find me in West Bay, Centennial Towers, on a Wednesday afternoon, dealing with my constituents as and when they, they come to see me. And so, Madam Speaker, I say that to say for anybody that isn't aware of that system in place, please do contact my West Bay office, and they will try to arrange whatever meetings as necessary and we will try to accommodate you as quickly as possible. Madam Speaker, I also, as a representative of the District of West Bay, was very instrumental in working with a, a community group that organized a number of community-based activities, which they called Music Under the Stars events. And we hosted three events last year, Madam Speaker, and it was a great opportunity for community empowerment themselves. These were projects that were run by members of the community. They came together, they fellowshiped. It was an opportunity to highlight local West Bay talent, talent such as the Majestics Band and Miss Darien Scott's Children Dance Troupe, which always was a, a crowd pleaser. And Madam Speaker, I look forward to continuing to support the efforts and my office supporting the efforts of any community group in the District of West Bay, Madam Speaker, who wants to bring forward these positive, wholesome activities for the community to enjoy. Madam Speaker, my West Bay MLA office also facilitated free financial planning workshops conducted by Mr. Ralph Lewis at the office. And I want to say here, Madam Speaker, that the, uh, the uptake was excellent. We had over 20 persons in each of these sessions. Um, and the fact is we will continue to offer the additional sessions in the coming year at the availability of Mr. Lewis in this regard. And so uh, my constituents who are, who are I have contact information for will be notified officially by email in that regard. Madam Speaker, with respect to initiatives for 2015-2016 and projects of concern for the District of West Bay, Madam Speaker, there is a real concern with respect to space and cemetery space as it relates to the District of West Bay. And since taking office, Madam Speaker, I have been in conversations with the Ministry and the Minister of Planning in this regard 
and I am given assurances by the Minister of Planning that their ministry is working very diligently in trying to secure a suitable site and land for additional space for cemetery in the District of West Bay. I'm also uh, in conversation and discussions with the Ministry of Tourism and the Minister of Tourism and the Councillor for Tourism as it relates to uh, attempting to create a West Bay heritage craft market that is suitable and convenient for the route of tourists that go to visit other West Bay tourist district uh, or district tourism attractions. And so, Madam Speaker, the government is looking into this, and I want to thank um, the relevant ministries as well for moving this project along, and hopefully we will be able to actually uh, get something in concrete form in short order. Madam Speaker, I've also been talking with the Minister of Sports regarding bathrooms at the Town Hall play field or the Sir John Cumber Primary field, Madam Speaker. And again, the Minister Borden has given a commitment to look into the issue and to see what can be done in order to address the concern um, during this administration. Madam Speaker, speaking very briefly now to the government-wide initiatives that, as I said, are of particular concern to me, and there are a number of them, and I will confine my topics to the ones that are absolutely of critical importance to me and the things that I campaigned on and the things that I stand for and that I support this government in moving forward. Madam Speaker, government finances and restoring a culture of fiscal responsibility and prudent financial management was one of the key platforms of my candidacy and is one of the key platforms of me being a member of this coalition government. Madam Speaker, this government has actually established a sinking fund. We have set up a fund which was designed to pay down the debt as it comes due. And Madam Speaker, we have a current balance of $18 million in that fund. Madam Speaker, we also vowed to implement a revised and comp comprehensive procurement process that provides transparency, accountability, and ensures value for money for the government. And so that, Madam Speaker, is very much in line with the things that I feel are absolutely critical for us to continue to thrive as a jurisdiction. Madam Speaker, I spoke about crime and public safety and what we're doing in the Ministry of Education to address this. But I'm also, Madam Speaker, looking forward to seeing the rehabilitation of offenders law come before this honorable house and come before cabinet in due order. Madam Speaker, we've also um, talked about, and I just want to um, go back with your indulgence to talk about something that I forgot to mention um, when I was talking about the West Bay issues, and that is to do with the road works that is currently taking place in the District of West Bay. Madam Speaker, there are a number of significant road works being t that are either scheduled to take place that are, are taking place as we speak, and one of the key road works that is actually um, in train is looking at the situation on the Birch Tree Hill Road. Madam Speaker, that is a road that we know that has been in need of repair for time immemorial. And um, this is something that the government has, recommend, has recognized. I have spoken to a number of my constituents on this, and a number of them have raised this issue. And I'm happy to say that the government has responded in kind and ensuring that we are addressing the needs in the District of West Bay as it relates to the critical roadways and Birch Tree Hill Road being one of them, Madam Speaker, but there are a number of other access roads which are being dealt with. And of course, Madam Speaker, the issue, as I was talking to with respect to crime and public safety, Madam Speaker, we know that the District of West Bay, in many instances, we're not the only district that suffers from issues as it relates to crime, but for some reason, we are 
one of the most popular districts that tend to be highlighted when these issues occur. And so, Madam Speaker, as I indicated to you, crime and public safety is absolutely uh, an important and vital goal of mine as a member of this government. And Madam Speaker, I believe that the government needs to develop and implement a comprehensive crime reduction policy, working across all of the relevant ministries, which addresses and focuses on the various stages of crime prevention, restorative justice, offender rehabilitation, and community reintegration. And Madam Speaker, uh, one of the programs that I didn't mention, that I will mention now, that as Minister of Education, I continue to support, and as a ministry, and as a government, we support, and that is working in the schools with the um, Youth Act Trust, um, working as partners to develop an anti-crime strategy in our schools as well. And so, Madam Speaker, as I said, from across the government, this is an area that we cannot lose sight of because if we don't deal with the issues of crime, if we don't deal with the needs of our people in this community, Madam Speaker, there will be dire consequences across the country. Crime of the nature that is affecting my constituency is not confined to my constituency, Madam Speaker. And we cannot see this as a constituency issue alone. Crime affects us all, and this government needs to take a serious, holistic approach. And as Minister of Education, I give you my commitment that I will do all that I can with the resources that I have at my disposal with respect to the work and effort and initiatives of the Ministry of Education, Employment and Gender Affairs to do our part uh, to address this issue of crime in that regard. Madam Speaker, another issue that is very important to me that I'd like to make sure that we do not conclude my speech or conclude my remarks without indicating the passion that I have for dealing with the mental health issues of this community. Madam Speaker, I have been speaking about this issue from the time I took this position as a member of government, and I will continue to speak on this issue until it is my time to be where I'm supposed to be. And I hope, Madam Speaker, that through all of the efforts that this government is taking with respect to mental health, and I want to commend the government right off the bat, Madam Speaker, for taking the view that we are taking with looking at ensuring that we have proper and adequate long-term mental health facility to deal with the issues and the needs of our adult population. I want to commend the Ministry of Health and the Minister of Health for seeing this process through, and I want to commend the work of the Mental Health Commission. The government knows that they have my support in this regard. But I also, Madam Speaker, want to continue the plea that I have been saying since taking this position, and that is to ensure that we provide for the needs of our children and our adolescents when it comes to proper and adequate mental health um, facilities, but also programs and, 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 and ability to get the kinds of counseling and services. And Madam Speaker, as the reports that have been recently published will show, as compared to the adults, there may not be as great a need for a long-term care facility for our children. But, Madam Speaker, if we do not address the needs of our children, if we do not address the needs of our adolescents with respect to providing policy programs and providing access, we won't be able to build enough facilities to hold the adults who will then take those places. So, Madam Speaker, just with education, just like education, we have to, as a government, continue to invest in making sure that our children are not neglected. We see and we have concrete reports that show the incidence of depression and the lack of mental health provisions for our children and adolescents. We see it in our schools, Madam Speaker. We see it in our communities. We see it in our homes. And I will continue to beat this drum, and I will continue to plea with the Minister of Health and the Ministry of Health and the Cabinet and the government as a whole, do not continue to neglect the needs of our children in this regard. We will pay for it three times, ten times, infinitely times over, 
because as they say, a ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure, or however the expression goes. You have 10 minutes remaining. So Madam Speaker, again, I say, the government has my support in making sure that we look at the needs of our children from a holistic perspective. And we need to take a multi-agency report uh, 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 approach. Madam Speaker, in conclusion, I want to say, and I want to quote the words of a person by the name of Joshua J. Marine. Madam Speaker, challenges are what make life interesting, and overcoming them is what make life meaningful. Madam Speaker, over the past two years, there have been a number of challenges for this government to overcome. And Madam Speaker, we have done just that. Madam Speaker, no doubt there will still continue to be challenges that lie ahead that will require measured but decisive action on the part of this coalition government as well in order to overcome those challenges. But Madam Speaker, the country should take comfort and the country should be heartened in knowing that based on our proven determination thus far to take action to deal with the many tough issues facing the country, which many administrations have either skirted around or ignored or did not deal with head on, that this government will not shy away from tackling the tough issues that others in the past have only talked about. Madam Speaker, on a personal note, there have been, and I suspect there will continue to be, challenges ahead, Madam. As Minister, and as an independent member of government representing the District of West Bay. Because Madam Speaker, in borrowing an expression by one of my colleagues in this house. This is an unprecedented piece of real estate that I occupy. But Madam Speaker, with all that has been accomplished in just two years, the government and the Ministry of Education, Employment and Gender Affairs, as a whole, we have demonstrated that a successful woman or man is one that can lay a firm foundation with the bricks that other people throw at him or her. Madam Speaker, we have laid a firm foundation with many of the bricks that have been thrown our way. We continue to work as a team. We continue to work as a government, irrespective of where we came from, we are here now. We are committed to demonstrate to this country that if you elect the right people who are committed to do the right thing for this country and our people, you will get the right results that will lead to the prosperity that we so strive for. So Madam Speaker, this government has a plan. This government, both independents and PPM members alike, is committed to working to achieve that plan. Madam Speaker, we are committed to do what is necessary to restore the confidence, to restore the stability, and to restore the fiscal responsibility in the governance of these islands. And Madam Speaker, we are committed to working to ensure that all Caymanians benefit as a result. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. You still have five minutes remaining. Well. <laughs> I recognize the Honorable Premier. Thank you. Madam Speaker, it's been a long and challenging day in more respects than I care to number. So I'm glad that we were at the end of the day and um, I think Madam Speaker we have four, four members left to speak including the winding up. 
And so I'm hopeful that we will get through the debate on the budget, throne speech, and policy statement by the end of tomorrow, and that we might be able to move into a finance committee on Friday morning. And so with those few sort of anticipatory words, I move the adjournment of this honorable house until 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. The question is, is that this honorable house be adjourned until 10 a.m. tomorrow morning? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those against, no. The ayes have it. This house now stands adjourned until 10 a.m. tomorrow morning.